Harriet Tubman, one of the most inspirational figures in American history. The stories of her fearless exploits helping slaves escape to safety on the Underground Railroad are justly famous. But less well known is the fact that she sustained a brain injury in childhood which left her with crippling headaches and a serious neurological disorder for the rest of her life. I'm Professor Graham Austin, and I'm exploring the incredible life of Harriet Tubman to find out how she triumphed over her disability and used it to find the motivation and strength to fight against the oppression into which she was born. Harriet Tubman was born into slavery on a plantation in Maryland sometime around 1822. Her mother worked as a cook for the Brodess family. Her father was a woodsman on a nearby plantation. While still a child herself, Harriet was hired out to a woman to do her housework and look after her baby. When the baby woke up and cried, which was often, Harriet would be viciously whipped, leaving her with permanent scars on her neck and back. When she was strong enough to do heavier work, she was hired out to nearby farms to harvest flax, haul logs and drive oxen. At the age of 12 or 13, she sustained a life-changing injury. She was on an errand to a dry goods store when an escaped slave ran in, closely followed by a plantation overseer who caught him. The overseer ordered Harriet to help tie the boy down, but she refused and the boy was able to break free and run. The overseer hurled a two pound iron weight at the boy, but it missed its target and hit Harriet on the forehead, knocking her out cold. She had to be carried back to the farm where she was working and was barely conscious for two days. She didn't even have a bed to lie in. She received no medical care, slaves rarely did. And as soon as she was on her feet, she was forced back into the fields to work with the blood and sweat rolling down her face. She said later that the weight broke her skull and would have killed her had it not been for her thick hair, which she never combed, so it stood out like a bushel basket. Afterwards, she said she was disabled and sick and her flesh all wasted away. So she was returned to her owner where her mother nursed her back to health. She had a scar and a permanent dent on her forehead, consistent with a depressed skull fracture and afterwards she started experiencing episodes of irresistible sleepiness which would come on suddenly during conversations and when carrying out everyday activities and no one would be able to snap her out of them. The injury also coincided with a burgeoning of religious enthusiasm which she had not shown previously. When she woke up from the sleeping fits she said she had been sent messages from God. Shortly after Harriet's head injury her owner tried to sell her, but there was no interest from buyers in his now damaged goods. Fits and seizures of any kind were feared in the 19th century, partly because they could lead to a change in behaviour, and partly because they were thought to be contagious. Even seeing someone having a seizure could lead you to having one yourself. There were particular concerns about seizures in slaves, from worries about them faking to avoid work, to fears that they could develop furor epilepticus or epileptic fury described by a New York doctor as a bursting forth of passions dormant during health or restrained by moral force with risk to themselves or others. The timid become brave, the gentle become murderous. Harriet survived her injuries and her episodes of sleepiness and she grew strong by sawing logs under the guidance of her father. In 1849, when she was 27 years old, her plantation owner died. She was worried that she would be separated from her family and sold off, as her sisters had been earlier. So she and three of her brothers decided to run away. In the end, her brothers decided to stay, as they were too scared of the consequences of being caught as runaways. So Harriet took her momentous steps to freedom alone. There are varying accounts of how she made the 130 mile journey to safety in Philadelphia. Some say she traveled alone by night, guided only by the stars. Others that she found refuge and assistance in a network of safe houses. But once in Philadelphia, she found work as a hotel cook and made contact with the anti-slavery movement, 
and she began to formulate a plan to return south to bring back her family to freedom. Unfortunately, things changed in 1850 when the Fugitive Slave Act was passed. This meant that people in the free states were required to help slave owners return runaway slaves, meaning that Philadelphia and anywhere else in the United States was no longer safe. Instead of going into hiding, however, Harriet was even more determined to help her family and as many others as she could escape to Canada. Her first mission took place in December 1850, rescuing her niece and her two children from Baltimore. The second, in spring 1851, rescued a brother and two others from the plantations. She was soon famous among both the enslaved and the plantation owners who wanted to keep them that way. But the idea that she had a price on her head of $40,000 is a myth that was dreamt up long afterwards. It is not a myth that Harriet displayed extraordinary bravery and resilience throughout her operations, however. Demonstrating an iron will. She carried a pistol both to protect her passengers, as she called them, from slave catchers and to encourage them to continue if they seemed to be wavering. Over the next decade, she made 13 increasingly dangerous trips to lead around 70 enslaved people along the Underground Railroad to freedom in Canada. During the Civil War, Harriet worked for the Union Army acting as a nurse, scout and spy. She was the first woman in US history to be involved in planning and participating in a military operation, the Combahee River Raid in South Carolina, which freed more than 700 slaves, many of whom then joined the Union Army. After the war, she settled in Auburn, New York, where she cared for her aging parents and got married. She continued fighting for the causes she believed in, the inequality of war pensions for black veterans and women's suffrage. She had to work as money was always short, but her biography, published in 1868, brought in some income and she eventually received a pension for her wartime work. Her sleeping episodes continued, as did her headaches. These became so bad that in her 70s she underwent a craniotomy at the Massachusetts General Hospital to lift the bone of the depressed skull fracture she sustained more than half a century before. Amazingly, she declined an anaesthetic for the operation, even though chloroform and ether anaesthesia were well established by this time, preferring to bite down on a bullet instead, as she had seen soldiers do in the war during amputations. Amputations were quick, however, usually completed in a few seconds by an experienced military surgeon, but sawing into someone's skull is a more delicate procedure, so she must have had extraordinary pain tolerance. In 1903, she donated some of her land to establish a home for the elderly in Auburn. But nine years later, when she herself had become frail and unable to walk, funds had to be raised to allow her to pay the admittance fee to her own home. She died in 1913 of pneumonia and was buried in Fort Hill Cemetery beside her family with a crucifix in her hand and the medal she had been awarded by Queen Victoria in her casket. Since then, her fame has grown and grown. Streets, schools, museums, a ship, walks and a national historic park have all been named in her honour and she has become an inspiration to millions. But what were the sleeping fits that Harriet Tubman experienced? In an effort to answer this, her first serious biographer, Earl Conrad, wrote to some of the leading neurologists and psychiatrists in 1943, outlining her symptoms. The diagnoses they suggested were hysteria, schizophrenia and narcolepsy. Not wanting to tarnish her image, Conrad chose narcolepsy. And this diagnosis has stuck. Narcolepsy is a sleep disorder characterised by excessive daytime drowsiness, brief involuntary sleep episodes, vivid hallucinations on falling asleep or waking up, and in most cases, sudden episodes of loss of muscle tone known as cataplexy. The cause is not fully understood. In some cases, it is familial. In others, it is autoimmune, and occasionally it occurs after a head injury. Narcolepsy could explain her sleeping fits and dreams, 
but there is no evidence that Harriet had cataplexy, and something this dramatic would surely not have gone unnoticed. A more recent biographer, Kate Clifford Larson, has suggested that Harriet's symptoms are better explained by temporal lobe epilepsy, or TLE. Visions of bright lights and hearing the sounds of loud music, rushing water, screaming and disembodied voices. Periods of tremendous anxiety and fear alternating with exceptional hyperactivity and fearlessness and dreamlike trances, all while apparently conscious. The seizures of temporal lobe epilepsy are different to classic tonic-clonic seizures in which people fall to the ground and start shaking. Subjects retain a partial awareness of their surroundings and are often said to be in a trance-like or dreamy state. The seizures are typically preceded by vivid hallucinations affecting vision, hearing, taste and smell, and a huge range of repetitive behaviours such as fidgeting, chewing or lip-smacking. And the visions? For Harriet, these were messages from God. She describes flying over familiar landscapes in her dreams and later recognising the terrain and being able to find her way to the north from them. But these could be interpreted as out-of-body experiences, which are common in temporal lobe epilepsy, as is déjà vu, the feeling that something you have never seen before is familiar. Harriet's symptoms could be explained by temporal lobe epilepsy, but there is no evidence that she exhibited any of the repetitive behaviours that are so typical of this condition. Interestingly though, clinical studies have revealed that up to 3% of people who have partial epilepsy have religious experiences before, during or after their seizures and increased religiosity between seizures. Could this explain Harriet's sudden interest in religion after her head injury? To try to decide which of the two diagnoses is correct, I went back to the biography written by her friend Sarah H. Bradford in 1868. This consists largely of Harriet's recollections, and although it is a fascinating book in many respects, there is very little information about her condition. There is a description of the incident that led to her head injury, and Bradford does link it to a sort of lethargy or stupor at times, but she does not use the words fit, seizure or epilepsy. However, we know from other accounts that the episode stayed with her for the rest of her life. In her 40s, it was said that she could not go for more than 15 minutes without falling asleep, and that it was not a refreshing sleep, but a heavy, wearisome sleep which exhausted her. In her 70s, a visitor observed that she would fall asleep at 30 minute intervals, her head would drop and she would sleep for 3 or 4 minutes, then wake up and continue talking without having lost the thread of the conversation. I have to say I've been putting a lot of thought into which modern diagnosis fits best, but I just can't come up with a firm conclusion. Some of her experiences fit best with narcolepsy, others with temporal lobe epilepsy. If she were being assessed today, of course, we'd get a much more detailed clinical history, a brain scan and an EEG to clarify the matter. But with none of these things available, all we can say is that whatever was going on in her brain, she didn't let it limit her life. She overcame her difficulties and with courage and sheer determination, she accomplished what few others had dared to do before her. And for her achievements, she is truly to be admired. But before I finish, I must say a big thank you to Ella Last, who assisted in researching this video. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to hear about other historical figures or celebrities that have been affected by mental health conditions, please check out my channel, Professor Graham Austin's Insane History. And don't forget to subscribe and click the notifications bell to be kept up to date with all the latest releases. See you again soon.